crucible, guys. Woo! Love it, 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 love it. First no, this video is full of spoilers. Spoiler, 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 spoiler. Make sure you've read the novel first. My junior classes read the novel The Crucible, which is absolutely a tragedy. In the end, the hero dies, and it's pretty depressing. When the book and the movie is over, I really like to ask my students to raise their hand if they felt that it was a sad ending. And the majority of my students raised their hand. So I asked them, okay guys, talk to me. Why did you think this was a sad ending? One after another of my students will raise their hand and tell me it was sad because characters died. They'll list different characters that they cared about that die, and that's of course what makes this a tragedy. But then I like to stop the class and I say, listen, if you remember nothing from this class, I want you to remember this one thing. If you think that death is a sad ending, then we are all going to have sad endings. Think about it. Every single happy ending story that you've ever read eventually is going to end in death. So is it happy just because that's where they chose to end the novel? At the wedding? Or at a child's birth? or when you kiss someone for the first time, so it's a happy ending, but that person's gonna continue to live. And at the end of their story, eventually all of us, every person, every character, your cat, your mother is going to die. And does that make their story sad? I don't think so. So instead of looking at literature as having a sad ending when characters die, we need to think about the life lived and the choices made. There are so many Shakespearean tragedies where Romeo and Juliet and Hamlet and Macbeth and there's just a pile of dead bodies at the end. But the novel The Crucible is a little different. Yes, there is a pile of dead bodies at the end of this novel, but how they got there and why they got there and what makes a tragic hero, I argue that it is not a sad ending. It's actually one of the most beautiful endings in literature. We have to remember that the characters in The Crucible were real people. And when you think about how many people died in the Salem Witchcraft Trials and how many people were accused of being witches, when you think about how many people died in the Holocaust or in big wars like that, I think about the six million, over six million Jews that died in the Holocaust and more. We know that we had thousands of homosexuals die. We had thousands of Jehovah's Witnesses die. We had two, over 250,000 disabled, 250,000 gypsies. So many people died in the Holocaust. Of the millions of people that died in the Holocaust, I can only think of one name, one family, Anne Frank. And what makes Anne Frank different? She wrote her story down. Arthur Miller did this, gave this gift to John Proctor, a real person who died in the Salem Witchcraft Trials. He made his name infamous. Of the thousands of people who are killed, there are very few names that we know, but it is thanks to Arthur Miller, he helped etch them in stone. So we're gonna talk about how Arthur Miller did this, how he made John Proctor. Let's be real for a moment. John Proctor at the beginning of this novel is absolutely the villain of this story. You might not think he's a villain, he seems to do all the right things later, but before this novel starts, John Proctor is the villain of this story. Let's backtrack for a minute and discuss what a tragic hero is and how John Proctor fills that role. Aristotle once said that a man cannot be a hero unless he can see the root of his own flaws. You're not a hero if you just narcissistically don't see your flaws. You have to see what your flaws are and know how to overcome them. But beyond that, in the official definition of a tragic hero, this is a character that has changes in his fortune, not from misery to happiness, but on the contrary, from happiness to misery. And the cause of that misery is from his own great errors. And yet, in his final resolute goodness and action, he is redeemed through death. A tragic hero has to have flaws. John Proctor has so many flaws. First, know that his affair with Abigail, what happens before the novel even starts, is awful. It's terrible. It's sagittary rape. She is a child. He is a grown man. Married grown man. That's an awful, awful crime. And yet, that is not his only flaw. 
If you pay attention to the novel, John Proctor has many, many flaws. He's abusive and aggressive to his servant Mary. He's cold and distant and judgmental to his wife. He literally had an affair six months ago and he's frustrated with her that she's not over it yet. How cold is that? And the affair was with a child! It's so bad! But there's a lot more than that too. He is the sole person who heard from Abigail's own mouth that everything that was happening was her and her friends playing in the woods. And instead of going and telling someone about it, he's kind of protecting her for way too long. You see his wife waiting and waiting and waiting for him to say something and do something and she's urging him, you're the only person that knows that Abigail was lying. So tell people, but he doesn't. He stays silent for way, way too long. If the courts knew about the affair from the very beginning, none of this would have happened. And John Proctor doesn't admit to it. In fact, he forces Mary Warren to do his dirty work. He literally sends a poor, naive, orphan teenage girl into the court, and it takes him the entirety of the novel to get it through his skull that he has made this grave mistake and that is what's causing all of this to happen. A lot of my students really love to hate Abigail and I get it. She's lying, she's killing people through lying, she's making awful, horrible choices. They were able to see her mistakes. They happened right in front of their eyes. John Proctor's mistakes happen before the novel even starts. And so you don't get that intimate look at what it is that he's done, but know that what it is that he's done is awful. And we watch him in act one and act two and act three, not make any significant changes, make any real attempts to repair his relationship with his wife. In that last act, the fourth act, he sees Elizabeth, his wife, break down and tell him that she feels like the affair was her fault because she wasn't good enough, pretty enough, that she was distant, that she didn't think anyone could really love someone like her. I hope that that moment, that scene, that conversation stopped you in your tracks because it stops John in his tracks. He'd been building up all this pride and then suddenly he sees all the damage this pride has caused. There are so many quotes that he says things like, I cannot go to the scaffold like a saint, like Rebecca Nurse. She's this wonderful human and I have so many sins. It's a fraud for me to stand next to someone like that. He says, my honesty is broke. I am not worth the dust on the feet of them you have hanged. He's completely broken and completely humbled. And sometimes it requires this level of humility for change. He has seen the root of his own flaws. He sees himself as already being awful and the lowest of the low, and he's just gonna go ahead and give them the lie that they want. Tell them that he's a witch so that he can have the rest of his life to make it up to his wife. Now really seeing her, feeling the shame of it for the first time. So he confesses to being a witch. He writes his name down on that paper, right? That scene is so beautiful because then you have Rebecca Nurse step in. What's interesting to me is a lot of the shame that John Proctor is feeling in the fourth act is the idea that he is going to be seen as Rebecca Nurse in a sense and Martha Corey. The idea to John Proctor that he would be hung standing alongside these two great women and that's almost embarrassing to him that he would be standing next to them when they died he would feel like a fraud. So he decides to confess. And that sweet Rebecca comes in and changes the entire mood. Time out, we're gonna talk about Martha Corey, Giles Corey, and Rebecca Nurse for a moment. These other giants in the community who were killed during the witchcraft trials. All three of them were very loved. Rebecca Nurse was known throughout the community as being a saint of a human. Seriously, she seems like the most wonderful woman who's ever lived. And Martha Corey was completely loved also. Despite what the court is saying about them, these two women know their own worth. These are people that we today are proud of. There are statues to Rebecca Nurse's memory, and Giles Corey's last words as they're stacking weight on him to have him give up this name is more weight. What a badass! Seriously, these people are going down in history like Anne Frank. You see, there are fates worse than death and John Proctor recognizes this. This moment when he is refusing to condemn others of witchcraft. This moment of him ripping up his confession and accepting his fate. This moment is what makes him a hero. 
And Reverend Hale says, man, you cannot. You're going to die. John Proctor's response, I can. And there is your first marvel that I can. Despite my sins, despite my past, I can be the kind of man who makes a change and have the honor of dying next to someone like Rebecca Nurse and Martha Corey. This is the marvel of this novel, that this character who begins the novel as the villain of the story by the end gets to become the hero. And it's because of this act, this final scene, where he's recognizing his flaws, his contribution to this entire problem, and instead of lying and living the rest of his life, he's going to take ownership of it. He's going to give Rebecca Nurse and Martha Corey the dignity that they deserve and accepting his own consequence. In retaining his honesty and giving up his life, he becomes a hero. But this is a lesson for all of us that doesn't matter the mistakes you've made in the past, that what matters is what you're doing now. And that is the marvel of this novel, that in the beginning he can be a villain, but by the end of the novel, we are rooting for him, we are proud of him, and like Elizabeth said, he has his goodness now. Who am I to take it from him? Ugh, it's gorgeous. There are fates worse than death. I love how they trick you. You think the main character is going to be Abigail and then you watch her descent into crazy and then this villain descends into goodness. 